Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's uh, 12 o'clock. It's time for our midweek Bible study. I see uh, connections are being made. Karen Walker and Bonzel Woods are with us. God bless you. Welcome to all of you who are connecting with us virtually on Facebook Live. Time for Bible study. Bernita Redding is with us. God bless you. Good to see your name, Bernita. Yeah, hope all is well with you and the family. Yeah, I see you, Karen, Brother Ali. I saw Brother Ali last night at worship. Good to see your name come through, Brother Ali. Welcome to all of you who are connecting with us virtually today. We are going to be on our third week of our study on parables. We're looking at the parable of the mustard seed today. And you'll find that in the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel. Francis Brown is with us. Lillian Brown, K.D. Brown Lad, bless you. Good to see y'all connecting today. I appreciate the faithfulness and commitment that all of you are showing week after week in our uh, Bible study. Thank you so much. Others are connecting. Wanda Mitchell is with us. So Wanda recently at worship. Good to see your name come through. Wanda, who else is connecting with us today? Sister Felinda Woods, bless you. Good to see you. Again, lesson, this is lesson three in our, in our study on the parables of Jesus Christ. Mark 4, verses 30 through 34, our principal passage. I see you, Peyton. God bless you. Saw Peyton uh, recently at worship. Good to see, good to see uh, your name come up, Peyton. Who else? God bless you. Bless you. All of y'all. Someone not um, some do not notify us and we appreciate all of you who are not part of the notifications darling pinson bless you brenda scott shirley moore sister moore welcome good to see you your name come up sister wingard god bless you god bless you let's have a word of prayer father we thank you for another day and for the opportunity to study together we lift up all that's said and done today god that it would bring you glory that it would empower us help us oh god to hear your word to receive it to understand it and to apply it we don't want to leave it unapplied god we don't want to merely know what your word says and understand it we want to see the power inherent in that word in its application in relationships and circumstances and in our thinking god and so we thank you in advance for what you're going to do today, and we give you the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Pat Yancey's with us. I see you, Charlene Cater, Sister Faye Davis. Bless you, Sister Seabrook, and Errol Harper. Bless you. Good to see your name, Errol, and all of y'all that are connecting. We uh, Looks like our usual crew is showing up today, and I'm glad to have you all right let me read uh some verses for you louise bless you good to see you let me read some verses for you principal passage today mark 4 30 through 34. again jesus said sandra hill bless you what shall we say the kingdom of god is like or what parable shall we use to describe it it is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. Y'all see that? With such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. That's the parable, verses 30 through 32. Verse 33 goes on to say, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. All right. That's in its that's verses 30 through 34 of Mark 4. Others are connecting. Kareen Hunter, bless you. Elder Mass and Sandra Hill and Wanda Brown and Craig Hill and Jeffrey Coleman. Hey, Jeff. Uh, yeah, uh, Jeff, give me a holler when you get a chance. Look forward to talking to you soon. Teen Durham is also with us. Okay, that was Mark 4. Carolyn Freeman, bless you. Good to see you. 
uh, Mark 4, 30 through 34. Now, let's begin with this. We just looked at the parable of the mustard seed in Mark 4, 30 through 32 in particular. I want you to know that Jesus used or referenced or referred to mustard seeds more than once in his teaching and in his speaking. He used the mustard seed in multiple illustrations and or parables. So Mark 4, 30 through 32 is not the only instance of Jesus using the mustard seed as either a parable or to illustrate a truth about the kingdom. Okay, now what is the kingdom? The kingdom is a kingdom is an area or society where the king's word is law. So Jesus, how does, this, how does it begin in verse 30 of Mark 4? Jesus said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? You see how Jesus is beginning there? Jesus is saying, how can I get you to understand principles or a principle about the kingdom? And then what does he go on to do in verse 31? He says, it is like, what's like? The kingdom, like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Okay? All right, so in this particular parable, Jesus wants to make, he wants to illustrate a truth about the kingdom. So he uses the mustard seed as an example to explain what the kingdom of God is like. But again, what did we begin with? We began with the thought that Jesus used a reference, an illustration of a parable about the mustard seed multiple times in the New Testament or in the Gospels in particular uh, in order to describe principles of the kingdom. In Matthew 17, let's look at Matthew 17. I hope you have your Bibles. Matthew 17, verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. So this is that episode where Jesus had been away with Peter, James, and John at the transfiguration. And when he returned, he returned to discover uh, that the remaining disciples had been trying to free a boy of demonic possession. Uh, verse 17 of Matthew 17, Jesus says, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I, shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus and in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. And listen to Jesus here. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Christine Washington Miller's with us today, and David Berryhill, welcome to all of you. All right, so here's another example of Jesus talking about a mustard seed, whether parable or illustration, he uses the mustard seed as a way of explaining what life is like in the kingdom. Verse 20, Jesus says, the reason y'all couldn't heal the boy is because you lack faith. If you got faith even as small as a mustard seed, that's enough in the presence of God to make a difference in the situation that you are praying to God about. You'll see that? God bless you, Cheryl Ricketts. We welcome you today. That's what he says in verse 20. If you have faith, as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. Now, in Luke 17, I'm, try, I'm giving you multiple examples of Jesus talking about mustard seeds. In Luke 17, uh, beginning with verse 4, Jesus had just been asked 
by one of his disciples, if a person sins against you multiple times, how many times should you forgive them? Listen to what Jesus says in verse 4. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, Jesus says you must forgive them. Verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. What does that mean? Lord, we don't see no way we can do that because it'd be hard for us to forgive somebody after they do us wrong one time. But Jesus says you must even after seven times. What's their response in verse 5, Luke 17? Increase our faith. And look at verse 6. Because what do they say? Increase our faith. Verse 6, Jesus replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So there are multiple examples in the New Testament where Jesus, and I'm just laying the foundation here and giving us an introduction to this parable of the mustard seed. There are multiple times in the New Testament where Jesus uses the mustard seed in either a parable or in an illustration to talk about a principle of the kingdom of God. Because the way, listen, the, the world's kingdoms acts, di the way the world's kingdom acts is different than the actions that take place in the kingdom of God. The world's kingdoms are different from God's kingdom. Let's look at one more thing. Matthew 4, and this is our original text for this study. Matthew 4, Mark 4, I'm sorry, Mark 4 verse 30. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? There's a question there. Y'all see that? It's right there. Hope you got your Bibles. Mark 4 verse 30. Jesus said, because there's a question mark at the end of verse 30, Jesus is raising a question. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? Well, God bless you, Sister Derek Hart. Glad to have you. Um, either Jesus is like thinking out loud, scratching his head, saying, now what can I say about the kingdom to y'all? How can I describe it to you? But if he's not scratching his head, talking to, or speaking to himself kind of rhetorically about how sh should I describe the kingdom to my disciples, what Jesus is probably doing is recognizing the fact that his disciples thought of the kingdom in one way. Welcome, Sister Fambro, Sister Slayton, that, that Jesus' disciples saw the kingdom one way. And he knew that their perception or idea of the kingdom was different than his and that he would need to correct their understanding of the kingdom. Y'all see that? I mean, what did Jesus, what the scriptures say Jesus came preaching at the very beginning? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent because the society where God's word is the law as our king is at hand. And Jesus' point is, I am the representation of that kingdom to you right now. All right, so multiple times he uses the mustard seed to describe the kingdom. Now, when I just quoted Jesus saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I'm saying to you that Jesus' ministry was always about the kingdom and understanding what life in the kingdom is about because Jesus knew his disciples perceived of and thought of the kingdom in one way but God himself wanted to help them understand that the kingdom operated in a different way than they than they thought now it's just proof that we're always thinking different from God and that God is always trying to get to us to help us understand the things we misunderstand. In 1 Samuel 8 and verse number 5, the people of Israel say to Samuel, we want a king like all the other nations. 1 Samuel 8 and 5, they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. We think differently than God. 
the kingdom operates on different principles than the kingdoms of the of the world y'all see what i'm saying so so when the people told samuel they wanted a king like all the other nations in first samuel 8 god said okay if that's what y'all want I give y'all what y'all want and I give y'all the kind of person that y'all are looking for and it turned out to be Saul and Saul's reign as king ended miserably and ended tragically. So what I'm saying is God understands that we see things differently than he does because he's God. But the good thing about God is he's always trying to position us to see things from his perspective so that we might understand things as he understands them. When the disciples thought of um, the kingdom, they thought, they thought of the overthrow of the Caesar of Rome and the reestablishment of Israel's independence and Israel's greatness. Now, when they saw Jesus giving sight to the blind and opening deaf ears, they said to themselves, you know what? This is the kind of dude we need <laughs> to overthrow what we've been putting up with for all these years. This is the kind of dude we've been looking for. This is the one that Scripture's been talking about. And of course, he was the one that Scripture was talking about, but he did not come to establish the kind of kingdom that they expected him to establish. I see you, Todd and your Arnold and Pat Clark. God bless you. Welcome to y'all today. Y'all see what I'm saying? So when Jesus says, what should I say to describe the kingdom to them? It's not just for the purpose of giving them information, but for the purpose of correcting their misunderstanding of what the kingdom is truly like. Jesus did not come to overthrow, overthrow Rome. He did not come to establish a throne in Jerusalem, but, but rather to establish a throne in the hearts of believers because God is not looking to provide us with external or outward changes. He's looking to provide us with internal changes, you know, making us a better people by helping us to connect better with him. So Jesus spent three years with his disciples trying to explain to them the nature of the kingdom. I mean, that's what he came for again the very first thing he said in public ministry was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So I don't ever want y'all to lose that sense of the importance of understanding the kingdom of God and how it operates, how it maneuvers and how we should operate in that kingdom. Jesus spent three years trying to explain the nature of the kingdom to them. And very often what the New Testament shows us is that Jesus often used parables as an entry point. I mean, read Matthew 13. If you read through Matthew 13, Jesus keeps saying the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like. He repeats that and then after that he tells a parable. That happens over and over again in Matthew 13 because he needed them to understand what God's kingdom is truly like. So Jesus tells multiple parables about the kingdom, illustrating principles of the kingdom throughout the New Testament because there are multiple facets to that kingdom, but they are all tied to the fact that the king's word is law and that that king is God himself. Jesus says, Mark 4, verse 30, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? Oh, man, you know, when I say that Jesus spent three years trying to explain that to his disciples, I'm, I'm, I'm also suggesting that in order to get to that understanding, you got to move away from what makes you comfortable. What You got to get out of your comfort zone See, God is for God to move us somewhere, it, it ain't easy to do because we like parking where we're at. You know, this is my parking space. This is my designated spot. And God says, well, there's another spot a bit down the road, but you're going to have to crank the car up and drive it there. You're going to have to work a little bit. And it's going to put you in a better position than the parking space you have now. 
Y'all see what I'm saying? That's what God is trying to do. The task of Jesus was to get them out of what they had been comfortable with, make them uncomfortable so that they might be better. What God tries to do with us is when we get comfortable to move us. He says, okay, you've gotten to this spot, but now you've gotten comfortable there. There's something else ahead. And so I need to work you a little, I need to work you some because I'm trying to take you somewhere. I'm trying to get you somewhere. God is trying to make us, conform us more and more to the example of Jesus Christ. That's the reason God is trying to move us. God is trying to help us be more and more like his son. The real comfort doesn't come until Jesus comes back and everything is established and all of that. The, the only time we are meant really to be comfortable is heaven. But until heaven, we are meant to work and to grow. Preacher asked me last night. He said, how do you want your ministry to end? And I thought about it for a second and then I, I said to him, I want my ministry to end with me helping people to truly become disciples. I wouldn't have given that answer years ago because I wasn't mature enough to understand it because we were talking about size of churches, numbers, and all of that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, he said, yeah, the, the numbers really don't matter, do they? And I, you know, I, I agreed, yeah, the numbers don't matter what matters is is discipleship and truly becoming disciples so that we order our steps according to the example of Jesus Christ and so you know the comfort comes in heaven but until then there's work for us to do and um, doing that work will brings it will bring us out of our comfort zone okay all right Let's look at the parable again, Mark 4, verses 30 through 32. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Let's listen, if he used the mustard seed as an example over and over again in illustrations and in parables. One of the things that's coming out of this text and the whole use of the mustard seed because of its size is that Jesus is saying to us, don't be discouraged with a small beginning. Okay, that's the first thing. Don't be discouraged by a small beginning. Don't be discouraged rather by a slow beginning. Listen, don't be discouraged by a small beginning. Don't be discouraged by a slow beginning. God loves to begin in our lives with things that seem inconsequential. God loves to begin with small things to show us what can happen when you begin with small things. Uh, What's this passage I wanted to read? I'll come I'll come back to it. Well, no, let me let me let me uh, go to I'm going to go quickly to Isaiah chapter 53. I don't have it in my uh on my printout. I thought I did. Isaiah chapter 53. Verse number two, and this is a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Isaiah says, don't despise things, don't despise things that begin in a small way. The mustard seed has a tiny beginning. That's what Jesus says in Mark 4, verses 30 through 32. But God loves to begin with stuff 
that seems inconsequential. Listen, have you ever had a conversation with somebody and uh, they said something and you really didn't think a whole lot about it at the moment, but later on what they said in that brief conversation, good to see you, LaTanya, in that brief conversation, you realize later that it made a difference, that it was a turning point, that it was a critical point in your life, but you didn't pick up on it at the time. It was pivotal. Yeah, small stuff like that. So we can't be brushing folk off, you know, because there may be something in what they have to say that's going to be pivotal to our walk with God. Y'all see that? God can take the most unlikely thing and do the greatest with it. Or God can take the most unlikely person and use that person as, as his instrument or his vessel. Rejected people often get God's attention quick. People who other folk reject. First Samuel 16, Samuel shows up at David's house in Bethlehem. Didn't nobody think that David was supposed to be the next king. Matter of fact, David's daddy thought so little of him, he didn't even bring David into the house to see. Inconsequential. He's probably shorter by stature than his other brothers, at least the brother Eliab. And, you know, the daddy says, oh, it can't be him. <laughs> He'd be out there with them dirty sheep all the time, you know. The people who get rejected are often the people that God chooses as his vessel. You know, you can take an unpromising situation. I'm talking about mustard seed stuff now, stuff that you and I don't think much about. An unpromising situation. And God says, no, that's a seed. There's life in that situation and I can get glory out of it. Wonder what people thought, you know. When Jesus was crucified, that was, that was a seed for the day of Pentecost. Y'all see what I'm saying? Yeah, and nobody, now people knew that Jesus was being unjustly killed, but didn't nobody think that there was no salvation tied up in it? Y'all see? And didn't nobody think oh, that that it would lead to what happened on the day of Pentecost. Didn't nobody see all of that coming? They just thought, well, they're killing a man who doesn't deserve to die. But um, I feel bad about it, but ain't nothing I can do. But nobody, nobody could look behind the crucifixion. Wasn't nobody there looking behind it to see what was really going on. Only people that knew was the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Father said, I got to do it to save creation. The Son said, and, and I'm doing it at, at your behest, Father. So when he said it's finished, he was talking about something that didn't nobody know anything about. Y'all see what I'm saying? Okay, okay. Uh, so God can get glory out of an unpromising situation. No one thought that the crucifixion, no one at that cross thought that crucifixion was a history making event. Listen, uh, let me see. Matthew 27 verse 42. He's on the cross and some people around the cross say he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Acts 4, 10 and 11. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the corner stone. Y'all see that? All right. An unpromising situation to those who were around, but... The Christ whom nobody saw as the Savior. 
because of the crucifixion, turns out to be the Savior and the chief cornerstone. An unpromising situation in his crucifixion. But all of that leads to salvation and to Christ being the chief cornerstone of the church. God can take the smallest thing, the thing that seems inconsequential, and make the greatest possible thing out of it. He can take the smallest insight and make the greatest testimony out of it. Okay? All right. There's three things I want to do now to finish out the study. We want to talk first about the purpose of this parable, Mark 4, 30 through 32. The purpose of the parable, the prophecy of the parable, and the potential of the parable. The purpose of it, the prophecy of it, the potential of it. Purpose of the parable. One, to give, to provide an understanding of a kingdom principle. How did we start? Mark 4, verse 30. Again, he said, and I keep repeating it because I'm trying to get y'all to see uh, how important it is to see yourselves, and for us to see ourselves as citizens of a kingdom that is not of this world. Um, again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? So he says, I need to use a parable to talk about what the kingdom of God is like. Yeah, don't miss that. Don't miss that. Part of the purpose of this parable is to describe life in the kingdom and to get his disciples familiar, not just with the language of the kingdom, but the nature of the kingdom. They were familiar with the word kingdom, but it meant something different to them. Good to see you, Brother Leroy Davis. But it meant something different to the disciples than it meant to Jesus because the disciples thought of the word kingdom in an earthly kind of way. To them, if you said kingdom, they thought about greatness and they thought about glory and they thought about power. When you said kingdom to a Jew during Jesus' time, they thought about David and how the kingdom was unified how strong the kingdom was, how independent the kingdom was. When you said kingdom to Jesus' disciples, they thought about Solomon. So they thought of David and Solomon and, and, and the strength and power and establishment of the kingdom. What do I want to read for y'all? Uh, listen, listen, and, and, and keep this in mind. Haggai 2, Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So, you know, Jesus' disciples and other Jews would go back to Haggai 2 verse 9 and say, you know what, the Lord prophesied through Haggai, Haggai that the glory of the present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. So, for them, that's prophetic that... Uh, the, that Israel and the glory of Israel under Jesus is going to be greater than the glory of Israel under people like David and Solomon. So they thought of kingdom in an earthly way, earthly greatness, earthly glory, earthly power. And when they saw, again, let me go back to the point I made earlier, when they saw Jesus doing, the, doing miracles, they're like, oh yeah, this the man. They were encouraged that Rome as a kingdom would be overthrown and that Israel's former glory would be established because of the things they saw Jesus do. And they said to themselves, if Jesus can do this kind of stuff, if he can speak and stuff happens, then we can count on the fact that he can speak in terms of Rome and Israel will be reestablished as the world power. So, the, the miracles of Jesus Christ encouraged the disciples when it came to Israel's relationship with Rome. Um, John 6. Let's look at John 6, verses 14 and 15. John 6, verses 14 and 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet 
who is to come into the world. Y'all see that? Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So he, Jesus does a miracle, and the people say, this is the one that scripture talks about, and they wanted to try to make Jesus a king by their own will and authority, and Jesus withdrew. Why would he withdraw? Because he didn't come to establish an earthly, earthly kingdom. He came to establish his kingship in the hearts of individuals so that he would reign from the throne of their hearts rather than some earthly throne in the city of Jerusalem. So part of the purpose of this parable about the mustard seed is to help his disciples understand and become familiar with the nature of the kingdom of God. So the mustard seed then is a clue. What's the mustard seed a clue to? The mustard seed is a clue to them and a clue to us to think small or to think differently. When I say think small, don't take that the wrong way. What I'm saying is don't be fooled by small stuff as if it doesn't matter. Y'all see what I'm saying? Don't be fooled by small stuff as if it doesn't matter. Um, Luke 19, verse 11. Luke 19, verse 11. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. You see, he keeps having to talk about the nature of the kingdom. I see you, Sister Moffat. God bless you. Charlotte Brookings Hus um, Hudson. God bless you. Y'all see, Jesus keeps having to talk about the kingdom because people keep misunderstanding what the kingdom is like. So the mustard seed is a clue to tell us don't overlook things which are small. Let's focus on eternal values because the kingdom that I'm talking about is not an earthly kingdom. Listen, there's not a whole lot of mention of faith not a whole lot of mention of faith, the word faith, in the Old Testament. You ever thought about that? There's not a whole lot of mention of faith in the Old Testament. Because of that, people like Jesus' disciples, when Jesus talks to them about the need for things like humility and patience and perseverance and all of that kind of stuff, as an application of faith, that sounds kind of foreign to them because... You know, they're assuming, well, this person is going to come and this person is going to come and just wipe all this bad stuff out and reestablish the old good stuff. And so, you know, when you when you when he he had such a he had such a journey in terms of trying to help them understand the nature of the kingdom because they didn't really see the need for the application of faith because they believe that it's all covered by the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, that ain't what I'm trying to cover. I'm trying to cover make, making you a better and a stronger person. I'm trying to cover, I'm trying to cover your heart. I'm trying to cover your soul. I'm trying to cover your mind so that you think differently because I'm not trying to change things as much as I'm trying to change you. Y'all see that? Welcome to you, Sister Linda Glover. All right, all right. So, so small beginnings, part of the purpose of this parable is to teach us that small beginnings, if they are used right, help us to see what success looks like to God. God, I mean, they ain't nothing that you can say to impress God, you know, at least, and let me explain what I mean by that, at least not the stuff that we are impressed with. That's not the stuff that God is impressed with. Uh, and that's why God wants us to, to understand and appreciate the fact that small beginnings will lead us to an appreciation of and an understanding of God's view 
of success. All right, and there's another thing that is attached to the purpose of uh, this parable, and that is, keep this phrase in mind, extreme variation, extreme variation. Um, verse 31 of Mark 4, it's like the kingdom is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest, y'all see that? The smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. So you got extreme. You got the smallest seed leading to the largest garden plant, according to Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? Uh, let's see. Let's look at something else. Matthew chapter 13, 31 and 32. It's the same parable. He told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, remember I told you Matthew 13 is all about the kingdom and parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. That's another, that's another purpose behind this particular parable. Jesus is expressed is presenting extreme variation. How the smallest stuff grows to be the largest stuff. The Bible is full of those kind of variations. You know, extreme variations. What about Matthew 23, 11 and 12? The greatest among you will be your servant, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Y'all see that another variation. Who's the greatest? The servant. It's not the king. So we've got extreme variations in the word of God, particularly in the teaching of Jesus, to show us that one of the purposes of the parable of the mustard seed is to present to us extreme variations in God's kingdom. Look at Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. We're talking about what? We're talking about humility. We're talking about serving. Uh, we're, talking about, um, uh, we're talking about being disciples requiring that we take up crosses and follow after the Lord. So greatness is in the, the level of service that we are willing to give. John 12, John 12, 24 through 26. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Y'all see that extreme variation in the word of God. So the mustard seed parable is about the smallest thing becoming the greatest thing. That's why the Bible is always showing us God using people that other folk would call nobody and showing them to be somebody. Keep these words in mind when it comes to the parable of the mustard seed. The issues of size, success, surprise, subtlety, and slowness. All of that in that one parable about the mustard seed. Size, it's the smallest thing. Success, it becomes the greatest thing. Surprise, you didn't see that coming. Subtlety, it happens slow without you really knowing it. And slowness, it takes time, but it does arrive. Y'all see that? Size, success, surprise, subtlety, and slowness. Are you unhappy with your progress? If you are, wait on God. Why? Size, success, surprise, subtlety and slowness. God is doing something in your life whether or not you know it. Just keep giving yourself to him and see what God will do. All right? That's the purpose of the parable. Let's go to the prophecy of the parable. Let's look at Matthew 13, 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Now remember, what did Jesus start off saying? The kingdom of Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, 
Jesus begins by saying, the kingdom is at hand, meaning the kingdom is already here in me. And then he goes on to give parables about what life in the kingdom is like, which means that the prophecy of this parable is that the new order had already begun. How do we know? Because he said so. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, it's already here. Now let me tell you what it's like to be in this kingdom. That's the prophecy of the parable. The new order had already begun. The seed had already been planted and the process of the seed becoming the mustard plant had already begun. Let's look at Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. That's Matthew 16, 24, and 25. Okay, y'all see? Again, the prophecy in the parable is related to the fact that it talks about the extremity of dying in order to gain. And what's the result? What does that mean then? That means... If God is taking small stuff and making big stuff out of it, then that means that, like Paul says in Romans 8, 28, that God is about the business of working all things together for our good. And we know that, listen, what I'm trying to say is, if God is working all things together for our good, then it is never our job to make it work. It's God himself that makes it work. The, pro the prophecy of the parable is that the new order has begun. And because, because God is unstoppable, he's making stuff work out for us because that's what he does in his kingdom. Our tendency is to try to make stuff work. Why do we try to make stuff work? Because we don't want our name to be sullied, because we want to avoid being embarrassed, because we be trying to clear our name. God says, no, I got this. I take the small stuff and make it work. You, you just walk with me. You know, it's like God telling Abraham, pack up your stuff, man, and, and uh, make your way to a new land. And don't ask me where you're going. Just... Walk in the direction I tell you to go because I got your back. I love you that much. I want that much to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He takes the small stuff. Uh, let me read something for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. And he said, oh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. That's Paul in 2 Corinthians 13 and chapter 4. Jesus is crucified in weakness, but that doesn't matter. God takes that stuff. He takes the stuff that looks weak that appears weak and makes something strong out of it. And Jesus was not embarrassed by the weakness. He said, he said, you know, the scripture says he set his face toward Jerusalem. He knew what he was headed to. He knew that he would be crucified and he was not embarrassed by that weakness. Jesus allowed himself to be misunderstood so that he might demonstrate the power of God that was resident in him, okay? The prophecy of the parable is that the new order had begun. Also, let's look at Matthew 18, three and four. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven like little children, seeds. Y'all understand? Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. God's way is always the opposite way of ours. 
we always trying to get there in a way that we map out for ourselves rather than understanding that because God is the only one that can work all things together for our good that we really need to be trusting in him and depending on him who do you know Jesus was looking for folk to be disciples to follow him so that he could pass on something that they could pass on to the world and he started grabbing folk that wouldn't nobody grab y'all see that he started grabbing folk there wouldn't nobody grab. He's grabbing fishermen and tax collectors and regular folk, folk that people would overlook. Why? Because God wants to show us he can take this mustard seed and make something great out of it. He takes ordinary people. Jesus chooses folk and folk look at who he chooses and say, oh man, ain't nothing gonna become of that ministry because of who he chooses. But those are the people that God delights to use. What happened in Judges 7? Gideon starts out with 22,000 and ends up with 300 because God says, I want to show you what I can do with a mustard seed. You know, Didn't nobody see Pentecost coming? Not at Calvary. People at Calvary couldn't see Pentecost coming. Why? Because they, they always forget overlooking the fact that God takes unpromising situations and small situations and does something big with it. Finally, the potential of the parable. The potential is this. If Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, starts out small but ends up big, and it provides space and shade for a lot of birds, you know, meaning that the kingdom provides space and shade for whoever wants to be a part of the kingdom. Jesus is saying to us, because he said this to his disciples, are you, as my disciple, prepared to be a mustard seed planter? Are you prepared to recognize the value and potential of every individual? Are you prepared? to stop overlooking people and dismissing them and brushing them off? Are you prepared for people to think of you as a, as a nobody? Are you prepared? Are you willing to accept people seeing you as a nobody? Because if you're prepared for that, that means that you are prepared to live a life of faith that you ain't tripping over the fact that people are overlooking you or thinking nothing of you. Uh, you know, in that story in Matthew 17 where, where Jesus talks about why his disciples couldn't heal that boy that had seizures and demonic um, uh, possession Jesus said, all you needed was just a little bit of faith. The reason you couldn't do nothing with this boy was because you didn't believe in the power of God to make it possible. You, you were saying stuff, but your stuff was not a true indication of the faith that you were feeling at the moment. You know what? Let me, let me end with this. God is not calling us to a perfect faith. Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus says, mustard seed. You got that much faith, you're going to be all right. God is not calling us to a perfect faith. He's calling us to having faith in a perfect God. That's the issue. The issue is not whether your faith is perfect, because he said you just need a mustard seed sized faith. The issue is not whether your faith is perfect, but whether you have faith in a perfect God. That's what's going to make the difference. This, this regarding, this seeing of life from the mustard seed perspective, is the place of faith. It's the place of faith. Finally, um, the Old Testament, Zechariah 4 and chapter 10. Who dares despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. How does that verse begin? Who dares 
despise the day of small things. God says, don't do it. Don't be overlooking the small stuff. Look at the example of the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, and yet produces the largest of garden plants. Mm -hmm. Now still, listen, here's one more thing. People would be more impressed with the cedar tree, the cedars of Lebanon, than they would be with the mustard plant, because even though it's the largest of the garden plants in size and stature, the mustard plant does not compare to the size and stature of the cedar of Lebanon, but that's all right because even though the church, even though the church has a small beginning and ends up like the mustard plant, the fact that it ends up the biggest plant in the garden still is not impressive to the world. The world is more impressed with the cedar tree in Lebanon than it is with the mustard plant, but that's because the kingdom of God is not of this world. And so no matter what the church does, the church will still be despised because people, people just don't want to give the Lord his due. But that's all right. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? God bless you. I appreciate you all today. Carolyn Garrett, bless you for being with us. Let me share a couple of things with you. Had a great revival service last night. Uh, Pastor A.B. Sutton brought us a great word, and I hope that uh, you were blessed by it. We have had some issues recently, some streaming issues. I got an email today saying that all of that has been straightened out, so we should be, we should be good for this coming Sunday for YouTube, Facebook, and our website. But listen, I want to see you. I want to see you Sunday at 9 a.m. in worship, so... Get yourself on up and get ready. You have gotten too used to streaming and too comfortable <laughs> with it. It, it, it. it was started as a convenience, and then as a result of the pandemic, it became a necessity. But God, was, God gave us a little time outside of the building to show us how important it is to fellowship with each other in the building, okay? So I want to see you all Sunday at 9. Um, Bible study next week. Uh, study of the parables will be on lesson four and I'll give you some more information about that this coming Sunday uh, revival our last night of revival is Tuesday of next week Clinton McFarland will be with us Cam will be our guest psalmist we're going to have a great night and we look forward to receiving the word of God associate minister night is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. I believe it's uh, Reverend um, Otis Lee tomorrow at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live. Food Bank is open Saturday from 10 to 12, and we'll be praying Monday at 6 a.m. All right. On the prayer list today, Sarah Clay, Carla Brown, Don Kloiber, Mary Jean Jennings, George Lee, Latanya Cook, Alexis McCoy, Danny Brookins, Paula C., uh, the family of Sister Stella Clark and Sister Pat Clark. Stella told me a couple of Family members passed recently, so we want to lift their family up. Uh, Loretta Lambert, uh, Marlisa Kelly, uh, Lenidra Thrasher, and her baby, Cami Lee, I believe is the name, and Sister Nesbitt. Sister Nesbitt had a procedure this week, and we are praying for her complete recovery. All right, that's our prayer list today. Thank you, all of you. I appreciate you so much. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this, your word, and the presence of your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity to study together, God, and for all of your blessings, God. Remind us to not despise small beginnings, God, uh, but to recognize the principle of the mustard seed and the growth that we see in it in the garden. God, keep providing shade for all of us, we pray, in your kingdom. And now, Lord, we lift up the names we've called there circumstances, their families. We pray that you would bless, whether it is healing or comfort or whatever the need may be. We lift up providence as a whole, God, and all of us who make up providence and all of our partners who join with us each week in study and in worship. Bless now, God. We lift up our preacher from last night, God. We pray for his safe travels back to Birmingham that you would bless his family and his, his ministry and his church. God, we love you. 
We say thank you in advance and thank you for what you've already done. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless y'all. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, yeah. I see you, Brother Langford. Bishop Richard Langford, appreciate you connecting today. Uh, and all of y'all who are connected, I thank you so very much. I hope you have a great rest of the day. For anybody that missed this, you can pull it up off of Facebook uh, after we are done. It'll be saved to our Facebook page. Have a great rest of the day.